All right. Um, order. 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 Before before I proceed, order. Before I proceed to questions without notice, I'll, a, a, a comment about question time for the foreseeable future. Senators will be aware that today is the first day of operation of the new temporary order, providing 30 seconds for the asking of supplementary questions, among other things. As it is not possible to set the clocks for 30 seconds, they will be set to one minute and stopped when the, uh, they reach the 30-second mark. Uh, other solutions are being examined, but it was not technically possible to make changes to the timing mechanisms over the Christmas break. So you will have to have a little bit of patience uh, with the uh, clerk at the table who will be setting the clock, but uh, we will try to keep the 30 seconds as best as we can. Questions without notice. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. How many people comprise the Australian delegation to the United Nations Copenhagen conference in December last year? What was the total cost to Australians of this delegation's attendance at the failed Copenhagen conference? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I, I don't think it would be fair to characterise the Copenhagen conference as failed. No. Clearly, <laughs> clearly, the outcomes, the outcomes uh, of the conference, well, the con outcomes of the conference, Mr. President, Order. were substantial, if not, if not uh, all that this uh, this government sought to achieve out of it. And we think, uh, we think, international engagement on serious responses to climate change remains a, a huge priority both for, uh, both for the world and for this country. And uh, I think uh, reflecting on what I saw of the release of the long-awaited uh, opposition's policy uh, today, where Mr Abbott couldn't answer questions about the detail, looked, uh, looked to be shuffling around when asked about it, and quite frankly it looked a fairly, a fairly inadequate and pathetic response. But I'm sure Senator Wong will have uh, have something to say about that at some stage in the debate. But Mr President, in relation to the specifics of Senator uh, Abetz's question, as I recall, these figures were made available in terms of the numbers attending the conference at the time and reported widely in the press. I don't have that information. I, didn't, I don't have it with me at the moment because, as I say, it's on the public record. But I, I'm happy to assist the Senator and either uh, refer him to the press reports or uh, check with the Prime Minister's office. But certainly I know those uh, those figures uh, were reported widely, but I'm happy to assist the Senator if he missed them and, uh, and get those from the Prime Minister's office and uh, make them available to him at the first opportunity. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, if the Minister doesn't agree with my definition of failed, does he agree with the government's own climate change adviser, Mr Ross Garneau, that the Copenhagen conference was, quote, a fiasco? The Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, uh, I, I obviously don't uh, agree with Mr. Garno's uh, characterisation of the outcome. I, uh, I think there were uh, were uh, outcomes that are worth uh, that were worth uh, while and which uh, which will help take uh, take it forward. As I uh, as I said, Mr. President, uh, I, they, they, these details about who was attending the conference were released. And my understanding from a brief just been handed to me was that there were 68 federal government uh, uh, delegates. Uh, the total size of the Australian delegation to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of the parties in Copenhagen was 98. So 68 were federal government delegates. The total Australian delegation was 98. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Mr. President, I'll, uh, I'll see if I've got. Uh, the rest of the information that Senator Abetz requested and provided to him. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. The minister doesn't agree with my description. The minister doesn't agree with Mr. Garnet. Does the minister agree with Labor's key business adviser, Dick Warburton, that given the failure at Copenhagen, there should be, and I quote, a delay in whatever we do until we have a clear picture? Given the fiasco of the Copenhagen conference and calls for the CPRS to be abandoned, 
Why is the government again forcing the parliament to deal Time. with its flawed legislation to inflict Order. a massive new tax on all Order. Australia? Order. Senator Evan. Mr. Question. Mr. President, obviously there was a whole series of questions in there. I don't think it would come to any surprise to Senator Betts that I don't agree with him. I don't agree with him about much. And in some ways I regard him as the definition of failure. But, uh, but uh, Mr. President, this is just another uh, uh, opportunity for the opposition to apply its new, new tactics, which is to pose everything and to try and dirty up the government, as described by, uh, by the leader, rather than seriously deal with policy. Rather than seriously deal with policy, Mr. and uh, and I'd remind the opposition that uh, that uh, at the last election they were absolutely committed to taking urgent action on climate change and were absolutely committed to uh, to a trading scheme, and that under their previous leader, the last leader, they were absolutely committed to it. Now it seems they've had another another policy uh, adopted in the in the last day, Mr. President, but they have no credibility on this this issue whatsoever. Order, order. When we have silence, we'll continue with question time. Senator Wortley. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Assistant Treasurer, Senator Sherry. Can the Assistant Treasurer inform the Senate of whether there have been significant developments in Australia's economic outlook and the world's recovery from the global recession since the Senate last met? How has the Rudd government's decisive stimulus strategy resulted in positive results for our economy? And will the government continue to deliver economic growth and to protect the jobs of Australians? The Assistant Treasurer, Senator Sherry. Well, thank you, Senator Wortley. Thank you, Mr. President. And all senators uh, have a happy and safe uh, 2010. Oh, yeah. <laughs> First question time. Um, <clears throat> I think more importantly, 2010 is shaping up uh, that the year, uh, as the year the world is going to emerge from the world's uh, worst global financial and economic crisis since the Great Depression. Uh, according to the uh, latest economic outlook released by the Independent International Monetary Fund, Australia grew by just under 1 per cent in the last uh, calendar year. Australia was in fact the only country, the only advanced economy, to record positive growth last year. The only country in the world, advanced economy, to grow last year was Australia. And the IMF attributes Australia's world-leading performance in substantial part to our, quote, timely and significant policy response to the crisis, in other words, the stimulus package. In real human terms, the stimulus package has saved around 200,000 Australian jobs. Some 200,000 Australian jobs were saved as a consequence. Tens of thousands of businesses would have closed if it had not been for the stimulus strategy. And this was a strategy opposed tooth and nail tooth and nail by the Liberal National Party. Senator Abetz says he doesn't believe it. Well, Senator Abetz, your uh, shadow treasurer is predicting a million unemployed a year ago. A million unemployed. That's what he was predicting. And uh, we, are, we are very, very thankful on this side of the chamber that the decisive action we took as a government has meant the saving of hundreds of thousands of jobs and tens of thousands of businesses. As I said, uh, uh, the IMF uh, does expect a stronger economic performance amongst advanced economies. Um, the uh, economic uh, growth rate for Australia is Senator Sherry, your time them. has expired. Senator Wortley. Does the Assistant Treasurer believe that there are significant challenges still ahead? And how does the Rudd government plan to continue to protect Australians from the worst effects of the global recession and guide the economy through to a full recovery? The Minister. Um, well, the international and respected uh, and independent IMF, uh, whilst it has said that there will be a stronger recovery this year, it is also cautioned that the world recovery does remain fragile, uneven and is dependent on stimulus support. The same stimulus support that the Liberal National Party opposed vehemently, which would have led to a million unemployed if we had, had, had their way. And the same stimulus package that they want totally withdrawn. The IMF, the independent IMF, has repeated its warnings that ripping out stimulus in advanced economies would jeopardise economic recovery. Of course, Senator Abetz continually dejects, 
Senator Abetz knows best. I mean, that's his claim. Senator Abetz matches his economic expertise against the experts at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and if we'd, uh, if we'd adopted the prescriptions of Senator Abetz and the Liberal National Party, we would have had a million unemployed in this country. One million unemployed. Um, Order. <laughs> Time's expired. Senator Wortley. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the Assistant Treasurer inform the Senate whether the Rudd government will continue to place economic discipline and responsibility at the pinnacle of considerations when formulating its policies? And is the Assistant Treasurer aware of any alternative policies? Assistant Treasurer. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Look, there are. There are highly reputable economists, economic organisations, I can list them, quote from them, uh, that have supported the stimulus strategy, not just in Australia but around the world. The, later, the last winner of the Nobel Economics Prize, a Mr Joseph Stiglitz, put in a recent article, put in a recent article those countries such as Australia that implemented large well-designed stimulus programs early emerged faster from the crisis. Others succumbed to the old orthodoxy pushed by the financial wizards who got us into this mess. And what we've got opposite is the financial wizard Senator Abetz and his colleagues, a Liberal National Party, who vehemently opposed the, uh, the Labor government's stimulus package. Who vehemently opposed. That was their policy prescription. Sit back, do nothing. Sit back, do nothing. Let the unemployment queues grow. Let businesses close and fail. That was their prescription, and that's not Order. the prescription Time's the Labor expired. government fortune. Order. Time has expired. Order. Before I call the next question, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber of His Excellency uh, uh, Mr. Javino Novoa, President of the Chilean Senate. Um, I, on behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome. And I would uh, extend, with the concurrence of my honourable colleagues, uh, the opportunity for you to take a seat uh, uh, next to me during question time. Yeah. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Can the minister inform the Senate by how much electricity prices will rise under the government's massive new big tax on everything, the emissions trading scheme? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Order. That was cruel. Order. On both sides. Senator Evans is entitled to be heard in silence. Order. Senator Mr. Evans. Mr. President, uh, I thank Senator Birmingham for the question. I remind Senator Birmingham it was actually a scheme that he was going to vote for, only a matter of months away. A scheme that Senator Birmingham was going to vote for, only a matter of months ago. Mr. President, uh, we, we, the Rudd Labor government, actually to, believe to, Sen Senator acting Evans, is Senator, cheaper than not Senator acting. Senator Evans, just resume your seat. Resume your seat. Order. Order. Senator Evans is entitled to be heard in silence on both sides. Time for debating. The issue is at the end of question time. Senator Evans. Mr President, this government is serious about taking action on climate change, not coming up with temporary little stunts like we saw today from Mr Abbott. What we're trying to do is put in place a market-based mechanism that allows us to seriously tackle the issue of climate change by putting a price on carbon and, and, and ensuring that we get a market mechanism that seeks to address the enormous pollution that, uh, we, that we emit and uh, the impact that's having on, uh, on the environment. So, Mr President, we, uh, we have decided to again uh, seek to get the Parliament to pass this piece of very important legislation. We will again give the Liberal National Party an opportunity to, uh, to honour their election commitment, honour their election commitment to the Australian people and support the emissions trading scheme. It has been the Liberal National Party's policy Order. at the last election Order. Order. and during this Senator term Evans. of Parliament. Senator Parliament. Evans, resume your seat. Order. When there's silence, I'll give you the call. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Sessional orders require that the minister be directly relevant to the question that was asked. The question asked was, by how much will electricity prices rise? The minister has now had one minute 
one and a quarter minutes out of his two minutes to start getting relevant to that matter, and I would invite you, Mr. President, to draw his attention and be directly relevant to the question asked. Senator Ludwig. Uh, on the point of order, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the, uh, the minister has been answering the question. It's unfortunate that uh, we now find another point of order, another frivolous point of order, being taken so early in the in the parliamentary year. But the minister has been dealing with the question, dealing with the uh, climate change issue that's embodied within the question, and of course uh, dealing with the substantive matter uh, very well, might I say. Order, order. I draw, I draw the minister's attention to the question, and there are 47 seconds remaining to answer the question. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, clearly uh, the impact of our ETS. Is, uh, is a relevant consideration when the parliament passes the legislation. That's why we've introduced it again. And we want, we want to pass the legislation. And we have had two attempts in this parliament to introduce that legislation, and you have had the opportunity to debate that legislation. And on some occasions you've supported it, and sometimes you haven't. The key point, Mr. President, is that what this government did is guarantee that families would be no worse off, that we would provide compensation, because we were we were keen on making the polluters pay. Our program order. was directed at making order. the polluters order. pay. Order, Senator Evans. Resu order. Senator Rebets. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, on a point of order, once again, sessional orders require the minister to be directly relevant to the question asked. He now has eight seconds left in which to advise the Senate as to by how much electricity prices will rise under the emissions trading scheme, and I would invite you, Mr. President, to indicate to the minister if he is unable to answer the question by being directly relevant, he should resume his seat. I cannot instruct the minister how to answer the question, as you know, and I, I do say that repeatedly in this chamber, as you, as you are aware. Uh, I invite the minister, in the eight seconds remaining, to address the question that has been asked by. Sen uh, by uh, Senator Birmingham, and you have eight seconds remaining. Mr. President, Minister. thank you. Mr. President, all the costings for the uh, government's uh, legislation are on the record and have been debated twice in this parliament. I can certainly take Order. him through them if he wants Time me to. Time has expired. Senator Birmingham. Well, thank, you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I note the minister did not give an answer as to how much electricity prices will rise by, but under the limited detail that has been provided, the government claims it will be 12 per cent, Minister. Minister, how do you reconcile that answer or that number of 12 per cent with the decision by the New South Wales Independent Pricing and Regulatory Tribunal to recommend price rises of between 21 and 25 per cent by 2013? because of the costs the ETS would add to producing Order. electricity. Order. Does this show Order. Time has expired. Time. Order. 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 It will not assist the chair with people intervening by calling time. I will determine the time in conjunction with that set by the uh, uh, clerk assistant and I'll do it in a fair and reasonable manner. The Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, uh, we made clear on the basis of Treasury modelling what the costs of our proposed ETS were, and we also introduced uh, a, uh, a compensation package designed to protect households from those costs, designed to make sure the polluters paid, something that is absolutely absent in the Liberal Party's policy release today. Mr President, we all know there are, there are pressures on uh, the state electricity uh, commissions in terms of the cost of energy, but in terms of the cost attributed to the ETS proposal by this government, the modelling has been done, the modelling has been made public, it has been included as part of the legislation and the debate around that legislation in this, department, in this uh, parliament, legislation that you were going to support until very recently, legislation you were going to support until very recently, legislation that you took to the Australian people at the last election, which you now have reneged on. But, Mr. President, we provide compensation for families and make the polluters pay. Order. Time's expired. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Doesn't this failure of modelling show that government is deliberately underestimating the costs to Australian families and small businesses of its massive new tax on everything? If the minister is going to continually rely on government modelling that he says has been released, will he actually release all of that modelling and all of the supporting data so that Australians can assess the true impact of the government's new tax? The minister. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Senator Birmingham seeks, uh, seeks to, uh, to debate legislation which, which uh, has twice been rejected by this parliament because of the failure of the Liberal Party to support it and to support their own election commitments. And what this government has made clear is you will get another opportunity. You will get another opportunity to debate that legislation. And we will go through the committee stages, and you can make those arguments if you want, Senator. But we have released the modelling that Treasury did that indicated the costs that would be, would be faced by consumers, and we also uh, produced a package that provided full compensation for them. We wanted to make the polluters pay for the pollution that they cause and the damage they do to the environment, and to protect Australian working families from the impact of the scheme. That's what we undertook to do. That's what we're still trying to do. And I'd like you to think seriously about honouring your election commitment, asking the Liberal Party to honour their election commitment and support an ETS for the, for the nation's future. Order. Time's expired. Senator Hutchins. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Innovation, Industry, Science and Research, representing the Minister for Education, Senator Carr. Can the Minister inform the Senate of the My Schools website? How successful has the site been? What does it play in the government's wider agenda for school education? How does it relate to the government's objective in increasing quality across the education system? How will parents benefit from my schools and what role will it play in shaping the future development of our schools? Minister for Industry, Innovation, Science and Research, representing the Minister for Education, Senator Carr. Mr President, I thank uh, Senator Hutchins for his question. The My School website launched last week has been a tremendous success. And I know all senators here would welcome that. My school is an integral part of the education revolution. It is an integral part of our drive, this government's Order. drive. S Senator, Senator Carr, just resume your seat. Debate across the chamber at this time is completely disorderly. I'm entitled to hear the answer being given by Senator Carr. Senator Carr. My school is an integral part of our drive to deliver the best possible education to every child in every school in Australia. And that drive includes unprecedented investments in school capital, in refurbishing every school around the country, in computers and in training centres. In fact, we have almost doubled the amount of money being devoted to school education. It will give parents, teachers and all interested Australians a better understanding of what their schools are doing and what they are doing well. It is also about giving them a better understanding of what needs to be improved. My school is all about transparency and accountability. And that does not mean just for principals or for teachers. As Sharon Brownlee from the Central Coast Parents and Citizens Association said in the Daily Telegraph yesterday, this will shine a light on bureaucrats and politicians to ensure that they fund schools to deliver education to kids. This government is already answering that challenge. We are dedicating more than $2 billion to increase support for disadvantaged schools to invest in literacy and numeracy, and to lift teaching quality. It's essential that people have the confidence in our schools. And my school Order. Time is an, has is expired. An Time's expired. Senator Hutchins. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate what kind of information is available on the My Schools website? What are the topics covered? and what are the government's plans for the development of the site and what additional information might be provided in future? Minister. 
Mr. President, the information on the website is comprehensive. It tells parents about national testing, about achievements in year 12, about the schools in the schools' own words, about the levels of advantage in the school, about attendance, about teacher numbers and about the number of non-teaching staff. It compares each school to schools around the country that serve similar students and it enables each school to see how it is going against the national average. In the future, we are determined to add information about the amount of funding each school receives from all sources, including the Commonwealth. And on the weekend, the Prime Minister announced that my school will also eventually include the results of surveys that measure how parents see their school and how satisfied they are with it. This is a new initiative to help parents the time's have expired. greater accountability. Time has expired. Senator Hutchins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Can the minister advise the Senate how the My Schools website has been received by the wider community? What level of interest has it attracted, and does the site enjoy widespread support? The minister. And what I can say without reservation that the community's enthusiasm for my schools has been overwhelming. The latest figures from the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority show that there has been 1.4 million visits and 157 million hits on the website since its launch. Now, it is a shame that the opposition does not support this fantastic initiative. They are divided on my schools as they are on everything else. The Leader of the Opposition admits that the parents of this country deserve this information, but the education spokesman for the Opposition has called the website Senator Carr, a white Senator elephant. Carr, just resume your seat. The time for debating this is at the end of question time, not now. Senator Carr. Mr President, what we do know is that those opposite have fought every inch of the way to destroy the legislation that will allow us to give funding information available on the My School website. The truth is order. that those time opposite— has expired. Time has expired. Senator Order. Senator Troth. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Carr. Is the Minister aware of the claims by the Autistic Family Support Association of Victoria that schools are deliberately exempting students with autism spectrum disorders such as Asperger's syndrome in order to have a higher score on the My School website? <laughs> Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Carr. Mr. President, no, I am not aware of the claim, and I would be very surprised, Mr. President, if that in fact was possible under the relevant legislation at state level at the moment. Nonetheless, I will make inquiries from the officials to establish what is known about the assertions and whether or not or the validity of those claims. Senator Troth. Well, thank you, Mr President, and to the Minister, in the interests of transparency and accountability, such as the Minister mentioned in his previous answer, what steps is the government taking to ensure that children with autism are not being unfairly refused entry into schools who wish to raise their NAPLAN score? The Minister. Uh, Mr President, I will make inquiries as to whether or not those claims that you have repeated are in fact the case. What I can say is that this government is providing $47.4 billion through the National Education Agreement uh, to each jurisdiction that administers this funding to make decisions about resourcing for students with disabilities. The Australian government will also be providing approximately $814 million to non-government school sector under the Schools Assistance Act to help students who are educationally disadvantaged, including students who have a disability. Now, this is approximately $159 million in addition to that that was provided by the previous government in 05 to 08. 
The responsibility for the allocation of these funds, I'm sure Senator Troth is aware, is up to the individual schools uh, within the non-government education authorities in each state and territory. However, Order. the Time Commonwealth— Order. Time has expired. Time has expired. Order. Senator Troth. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Does the minister agree with the spokesperson for the Autistic Family Support Association of Victoria, who said in a Metropolitan Daily last week that, and I quote here, that the My School information cannot be taken at face value? Unquote. The minister. Well, uh, Mr. President, there have been many comments concerning the My School website. The overwhelming number of parents understand its value, appreciate its importance and acknowledge how essential and timely it is that they have more information about their schools and the schools that their, that their children are attending. There has been an overwhelming success because parents are demanding the right to know, and it is a right to know that we will defend and we will take action to ensure that they have, despite your opposition. Order. Order. I'm, wait, I'm waiting to call Senator Bob Brown. Senator Bob Brown. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change, uh, Senator Wong. And I ask, uh, is it true that the opposition's policy on climate change announced today will do almost nothing to protect seashore properties in Australia from the impact of climate change? Is it true that some 700,000 properties are threatened by potential climate change damage in the coming this or, century. Order. No, order. Order. Senator Brown is entitled, the same as any other senator in this place, to be heard in silence, and there should be no interjections. Just wait a minute, Senator Brown. I'll, I'll, you're entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Brown. And I ask, uh, in view of the decision by the Land and Environment Court yesterday against the Byron Bay, Shire Council, it, it, uh, Municipal Council, is it uh, the government's intention to leave local government to pick up the tabs for the multi-billion dollar bill that will accrue through uh, coastal erosion to properties in Australia in the coming decades? Minister for Climate Change and Water, Senator Wong. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and thank you to Senator Brown for the question. I, I had assumed that, given the build-up to the opposition's climate change policy, uh, the big announcement that was billed today, Mr Abbott and, and Mr Hunt and Mr Truss out there uh, trumpeting their great new policy, uh, that the first thing coming would be to me uh, saying, isn't our policy great? Well, you know, they didn't even want to front up and have an argument about their policy, uh, Mr. President. It falls to Senator Brown to ask the government Senator Wong, about. Senator Wong, just resume your seat. On both sides, I need silence. Senator Wong, proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. It falls to Senator Brown to uh, ask me a question about the opposition's policy, which is, which is nothing more, Mr. President, than a climate con job. A climate con job. That's all they've come up with, with all the chest beating and all the hoopla and all the threats and all the politics. All you've come up with is a climate con job. And I'm sure we'll have plenty of opportunity in the coming days to just find out exactly how much your policy will cost and that it won't work. Uh, in response directly to the second part of Senator Brown's question, I am aware of the decision of the Land and Environment Court. Obviously, that is a New South Wales uh, jurisdiction, but the senator would be aware the Australian government is uh, extremely concerned to ensure uh, that we assist local government with gaining the understanding, with uh, understanding the risks of climate change. We released last year, as you may recall, uh, a, a study into potential sea level rises, rises as a result of climate change uh, to enable different levels of government to start to better work together on a better knowledge base to plan for the future. Mr President, the reality is those opposites are now led by a man who thinks uh, we know what he thinks of climate change. Senator uh, Wong, come time back has to expired. Later. Time's expired. Senator Bob Brown. I thank the Minister for answer and uh, I point out uh, by way of asking the Minister for comment that Byron Bay Council has led the world in a planned retreat policy 
for uh, 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 making it incumbent upon landowners and, and builders to be uh, responsible for building within the zone which is threatened by climate change. But the Land and Environment Court has not upheld that. I asked the minister how many billions of dollars does local government now face in payouts to people time, who build time within has the expired, uh, Senator Brown. Time's expired to ask the question. Senator Wong. Well, as the, as the senator would be aware, uh, this is uh, an issue that the government is uh, very aware of. As I said, we published a study last year which looked at potential levels of sea level rise, the number of Australian buildings uh, which could potentially be at risk. Uh, the, the, the reality is that what the senator is asking about is really one of the manifestations of the costs of climate change. And we know that climate change will, will affect and is already affecting our economy and our environment. We know that Australian coasts are also under significant pressure. So certainly in my colleague Minister Garrett's portfolio there is funding uh, for uh, the national uh, uh, through the caring for coast election commitment. As I said, uh, through my department we also uh, presented the national coastal risk assessment, which will uh, and has and is assisting local governments to better understand the risks. Can I say, uh, to be absolutely frank to the senator, this is Order. an area of work time, which requires all levels expired. of government to work. Senator Wong, time's expired. Senator Bob Brown. Thank you, President. But my question was directly about the cost. Is the Commonwealth going to leave local government to bear, totally by itself, the multi-billion dollar tab from the erosion of Australia's coastlines, which threatens up to 700,000 properties this century? The Minister. Uh, well, again, what I say um, through you, Mr. President, is this is an example of why this nation has to act on climate change, because we know that the costs of failing to act, the costs of failing to act, are far greater than costs of responsible action. Now, that was once the policy of the Liberal Party of Australia. Was once the policy of a number of the uh, senators opposite who are now interjecting. Uh, and I wonder why they do protest so much, because they know they have a policy released today which is nothing more than a climate con job. Senator Humphreys. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Citizenship, Senator Evans. Following the arrival of yet another boat last that. night, more yes, more than one, uh, carrying 181 people and four crew, uh, cruising into Christmas Island, actually intercepted within sight of Christmas Island. When will the Rudd government finally admit that its border protection policies have comprehensively broken down? Yeah. Minister for Immigration and Citizenship, Senator Evans. Mr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the Rudd Labor government is absolutely committed to strong border protection policies. The fact is, the fact is Order. that we have invested Order. more in border protection than any other government. What we are dealing with, Mr. President, at the moment is a uh, is a, a uh, situation where we're seeing record flows of persons out of Afghanistan, which is seeing pressure in terms of uh, unlawful movement and uh, irregular flows Order. throughout the world. And what Australia is doing is getting its share of those people fleeing Afghanistan. I'd remind Senator Humphreys that last year we had the fourth largest number of arrivals in a calendar year. The previous three record years were under the Howard government. And, 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 and they were 1999, 2000, 2001. And the reason, uh, the reason the numbers arriving uh, decreased after that was that the Taliban fell in Afghanistan and people were no longer found to be refugees and were returned to Afghanistan if they sought asylum. The same occurred in Iraq following the fall of Saddam Hussein. What we're dealing with at the moment is an international problem, an increased number of asylum seekers. More than 90 per cent still go to Europe. But, Mr President, we have strong border protection in place, we have mandatory detention, we have offshore processing. And we're determined, working with our neighbours, to combat this problem of unlawful arrivals. But at the moment, we are dealing with increased activity. We are seeking to work with our, with our neighbours to try and stop the flow, to try and provide durable solutions for people, both in their home country and in countries of transit. And we'll continue to uh, provide uh, resources for border, secure, border protection and uh, resources to try and address this global problem of unlawful and irregular movement. Order. Order. 
ora ora Senator Humphreys thank you uh, mr president um, given that the detention facilities and related accommodation on christmas island has a current capacity of 1848 people and the latest arrival of 181 and four crew will increase the detention population to more than 1830 that's within 20 beds of being completely full Will the government guarantee that no asylum seeker will be transferred to the mainland from Christmas Island before their claims have been determined? The Minister. The Minister. Gradually. Mr. Mr. President, uh, um, what uh, I can do is just correct. Uh, first of all, Senator Humphries, your figures aren't exactly right, but but effectively, uh, effectively there are about 1,800. No, in fact, it's slightly less. But the point is, uh, well, Senator Humphreys got the figures wrong, but I'm saying they're they're small, they're small, they're in small numbers. Mr. President, uh, we have we have remaining capacity at Christmas Island. We have capacity, and the capacity is being expanded. And more, more capacity has come online recently, and more will come on in recent weeks. But we have also made it very clear that if we need capacity, we will use the other detention centre built by the Howard government, the one in Darwin, the immigration detention facility in Darwin, to finalise processing if we need the extra capacity. I made that clear. But Order. interesting that today the Liberal, uh, the Liberal opposition member announced that you were returning to the Pacific solution, that you were going to again look for third countries to process people. Nauru was back on the agenda. Order. A very interesting time development, has, Senator. Time has expired, Senator Evans. Order. Spiderman. Order. Senator Humphreys. Thank you. Uh, has the, uh, can the minister advise whether he has received advice about the pressures and constraints on the operation of detention facilities at Christmas Island in the wake of the tenfold increase in the detention population during the last 12 months. The Minister. Thank you, Minister, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, I can advise that we are, we are dealing with an increased number of, uh, of persons in detention. That's correct. Nowhere near the numbers that the Howard government had to deal with in a series of camps around Australia, but we are dealing with increased numbers. Order. But, Mr. President, Order. what we have done is increase the capacity on Christmas Island. We've used the very, uh, very modern facility built by the Howard government, which only came online in 2007, as the Order. Howard government's preparedness for the next spike in activity. And we thank them for that because we're sure they wouldn't have built it otherwise. Order. Otherwise, Order. you're suggesting Senator they Evans. wasted 400 million. Senator Evans, resume your seat. Senator Evans, there's a point of order, I presume. Yes, it is. Senator uh, Humphreys. I, I asked whether the minister had received advice about the pressures and constraints on the capacity of Christmas Island. Could he answer that part of my question, please? I draw the, the attention of the minister to the question. You've got 23 seconds remaining. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. As I said to the uh, senator, and as he knows, and I told him on a number of occasions late last year, we are increasing the capacity on Christmas Island beyond that which was built by the Howard government and commissioned in 2007. And we, uh, we uh, anticipate a capacity of about 2,200 under the current proposals. So yes, there have been pressures in terms of uh, capacity, but we've expanded the capacity and are coping with the extra, extra Time uh, demands. Time has expired. Time has expired. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister assisting the Prime Minister for Government Service Delivery regarding the Nation Building Economic Stimulus Plan. Is the Minister aware that during the school holidays it appears that work on the Building the Education Revolution projects has increased? Can the Minister provide the Senate with information on the level of activity happening at our schools during the holiday break? Is the Minister also able to outline to the Senate how this vital schools infrastructure is supporting jobs? And how is the stimulus generally helping to support employment across the economy and are there any threats to the jobs that it, that it has sustained? The Minister assisting the Prime Minister for Government Service Delivery, Senator Abib. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can I thank Senator McLucas for the question, but also for the work she's undertaken, particularly in the far north Queensland and the community of Cairns, where unemployment reached 14 per cent. And the work she's done to create jobs, support the local community, should be commended. Uh, Mr. President, I'm pleased to inform the Senate that while Parliament has been in recess, 
the builders, the contractors, tradies and subcontractors working on the building the education revolution projects have been hard at it. As senators would be aware, the, project, the program is valued at $16.2 billion. And I'll remind senators that coalition senators voted against it six times. As at the end of December, Mr. President, so we're only halfway through the school holidays, in the nation's 8,000 primary schools, over 5,000 5, projects are now under construction. That is now more than double, now more than double from only two months ago. What that means, Mr. President, is that there are tradespeople on sites, wages getting paid, libraries being built, classrooms being built, science and language centres being built, and Tony Abbott, the member for Warringah, complaining. Mr. President, with the science and language centres, two months ago there were only 33 of those centres underway. Mr. President, now we have 503 science and language centres underway. 503. And all the member for Warringah can do is complain, Mr. President. He complains that the government has kept Australia out of recession. He complains about vital school funding, Mr. President. Vital school funding that was so neglected, so neglected by the Howard government, going directly to school communities. And as I, as I travel, as I travel, Mr. President, around the country, talking to principals, talking to school order. communities. Order. Your time has it. Time. Order. When there's silence, we'll proceed. When there's silence, we'll proceed. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister further advise the Senate on what feedback has been received from school communities about these school projects, and how will these projects improve the learning facilities for Australian students? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I was talking about some of the feedback I was receiving from principals and school communities. Can I, can I talk to you about it? Heather Harrison from Harvey Bay? Uh, what she said was, I'm not a teacher, but I will have the pleasure of working in one of these soon to be completed school facilities in regional Queensland. After being without a purpose built library for many years, I now look in awe at the facility we will have, and I still can't believe it. Or the, the Reedy Park primary principal, Barb Munt, who told Border Watch this week we would have had to have had Lamington Drive for the next 100 years to get the money we need to get to do these sort of things. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Mr President, compare that to the comments this week by the opposition finance spokesman, Senator Joyce, where he said, in relation to the building the education revolution, the rats have got to live somewhere during the Christmas holidays and a hall's a good enough place for it. Mr President, how out of touch, how out of touch is Senator Order. Joyce, Mr Time President? Time has expired. Order. Order. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister further advise the Senate on the progress he has personally seen going on at the many schools he has visited around Australia? What feedback has the minister received on those projects? And are there other examples of the response of school communities to the government's investment in the building the education revolution? The minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, uh, a week ago, I was in Perth and visited Westminster State School. Order. And, Mr. President, three three classrooms under construction, workers on sites, apprentices on sites, and money going into the local economy. School community happy, tradespeople happy, exactly what the stimulus was designed to do. And Mr President, again, this is an example of the other side being completely out of touch, completely out of touch with what is going on in the economy, what has been happening with the global financial crisis and the gains, the gains from the projects. And again, I'll come back to Senator, Senator Joyce when he said on the 10th of December, well, I think the whole stimulus package was not warranted. I think the stimulus package was inappropriate. Mr President, that means schools, school halls, school classrooms, school libraries. Your that time means road has projects. Expi that means time, time has expired. Um, it's, uh, Senator Cash is next. Uh, Thank you, Mr President. Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute, Senator Cash. I, uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to start uh, difficulties here. 
Senator Cash. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Citizenship, Senator Evans. Since the last meeting of the Senate, how many boats, in addition to last night's arrival, carrying how many unauthorised arrivals, have arrived or have been intercepted in Australian waters? Minister for Immigration and Citizenship, Senator Evans. Order. 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 Mr. President, uh, the uh, the uh, figures uh, for uh, last year are uh, are that uh, the number of uh, number of boats arrived last year was uh, 60. And the uh, number of people who arrived last year as unlawful arri offshore arrivals was 2,726. I can take on notice the numbers uh, since the Senate rose, uh, Senator, if that, you're particularly interested in that figure. But clearly, that's not how we record uh, the statistics. We don't actually align them with the sitting of the Senate. We actually uh, conduct them by annual figures. What I can tell you is that, uh, that uh, this Order. year we've had uh, nine boat arrivals. Uh, and, uh, but last year there were, uh, there were 60. I can also confirm the information that uh, in 1999, under the Howard government, there were 86 boat arrivals with 3,721 people, that in 2000 there were 51 boat arrivals with 2,939 persons, and in 2001 there were 43 boat arrivals with 5,516 people. So, in fact, uh, this year was uh, last year Order. was the fourth highest in terms of arrival, Senator. The top three years were under the Howard government when they were dealing when they were dealing with the with Order. the spike in people leaving Afghanistan and Iraq. When they, like the rest of the world, were dealing with that problem during that particular period, we, Mr. President, are now dealing with uh, the situation uh, in Afghanistan and Sri Lanka in particular where we have seen large numbers of people fleeing. Those people have been fleeing all around the world. That has seen an increase in arrivals in Australia, but has also seen an increase in arrivals in Canada and Europe and most other uh, Western uh, countries. So, Mr President, those are the figures for last year and this year. But as I remind the Senate, we have had uh, arrivals Time in about 25 expired. over the last 30 Time years. Time has expired. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. Given that the Minister has been unable to confirm the arrival of 22 boats and 985 unauthorised arrivals since the Senate rose last year, will the Minister concede that the continuing surge of boats over the monsoon season, which is traditionally a period of low arrivals, demonstrates that the people smuggling industry has been invigorated by the Rudd government's weakening of Australia's once strong border protection policies? The Minister. Uh, no, Mr President, obviously I don't, uh, I don't accept that. Uh, as I say, if you track uh, the, uh, the irregular movement of persons uh, out of source countries that are traditionally headed towards Australia, we are seeing an increase in activity as are countries in Europe and elsewhere. This is driven by the, uh, by the situation in Afghanistan and, of course, the worsening situation in Pakistan. And that's where the largest number of arrivals we have had. I also want to suggest to Senator that this, this argument about the monsoon season is not, it, it's got sort of folklore, but I don't actually think uh, it's a major factor from the advice I've had about impacts on arrivals. Because of, because of, the, uh, because of the shortness of the journeys, it hasn't uh, in recent years had a huge impact. But, uh, but Senator, I mean very clear, we are dealing with an increased rate of activity. It is a serious public policy problem and the government is working very hard to address it. And we're using all uh, our capacities uh, order, to try and address time, it. Order. Time has expired. Order. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. A second supplementary. Given that the policies the minister describes in response to the situation are patently not strong, are patently failing, not only in the eyes of the people smugglers but in the eyes of the Australian community in general, Will the minister now tell the Senate what new approaches the government will take to reverse the reality of an open-door Australia? 
The Minister. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to do anything about Australia, but I certainly am, uh, am uh, uh, interested in, uh, in uh, protecting uh, Australia's uh, borders, in ensuring that we, uh, we have orderly migration in this country and working with our neighbours to support uh, unlawful uh, movement uh, into this country. Mr. President, so we are uh, we are very focused on trying to deal with the recent spike in activity. We are working with Indonesia, Malaysia, and other neighbours to try and address that. But we are maintaining strong border protection measures that see boats intercepted, see people detained, see people undergo the normal health, identity, and security uh, checks before they are released in the community. Those found to be refugees are given protection. Those found uh, not to be refugees are returned to their country of origin. We think that's sound public policy. And if you're asking, are we going to go down the Pacific Solution route, which the Liberal Party has announced today, the answer is no. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Broadband, Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Can the Minister inform the Senate on the rollout well, of the national? Order. order. I, I'll have to ask you. I didn't. I know some people are interjecting. I couldn't hear. If you'd start the, the question again, I didn't hear. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to Senator Conroy. No, Conroy. I understand that. <laughs> I just want the I was question. for the benefit of those opposite. Can the minister inform the Senate on the rollout of the national broadband network? In particular, can the minister advise the Senate on the rollout in Tasmania? and the priority regional backbone links to six key regional centres across six states and territories. The Minister for Broadband, Communication and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can I thank Senator Polly for her ongoing interest in this important policy area? And Mr President, the rollout of the National Broadband Network, which as we know is the largest infrastructure project in Australia's history. It is, of course, a detailed and complex project. It is not a quick fix for an election, as those favoured by those opposites. And, as we know, the opposition have taken a great deal of interest in this. In the just over 430 days that Senator Minchin was the opposition spokesman, I wish to inform the chamber that he issued 180 press releases. That's nearly 0.4. That's 0.4 press releases a day. And you know what? Not one policy initiative in sight. Nearly a press release a day and not a policy initiative in sight. Whereas, unlike those opposites, we have a solution that will benefit this country into the long term. We are making significant progress on the NBN initiative announced last year. The rollout in Tasmania, as Senator Polly well knows, is already well underway, Mr President. The trenching and layout of the conduit for the transmission link between Cambridge to Midway Point has been completed. We are on track for the first services to be connected in Tasmania from July this year, with community meetings being held in Stage 1 communities in the lead-up to July. Significant works have also commenced on the mainland. Last year, we engaged next-gen networks to roll out almost 6,000 kilometres of new fibre-optic backbone links under the regional backbone black spot Order. program. Order. Time's expired. Senator Polly. Senator Polly. I thank the minister, particularly so, for highlighting Polly. how Tasmania is once again leading the nation. Can the minister explain why investment in high-speed broadband to all premises in Australia is such a priority for this government? In particular, can the minister advise the Senate of the sorts of benefits that we can expect from this type of investment? Minister. Minister. Thank you. Mr President, high-speed broadband is about far more than downloading movies faster, as claimed by those opposites. That is like saying that investment in ubiquitous electricity networks in the 19th century was only ever going to be used for streetlights. The NBN will be the enabling platform for a range of applications in the health, the education, the energy and the 
aged care sectors, Mr. President. Investment in high-speed broadband is about investing in health by promoting things like remote diagnosis and telemedicine. It is about investing in education, giving students access to multimedia learning no matter where they live. It is about investing in energy efficiency measures, encouraging the use of smart grids and smart infrastructure technology Order. to Your better time manage has the expired. use of Time's expired. Senator Polly. Mr President, my final supplementary is, can the minister explain what other benefits high-speed broadband will deliver to the Australian economy? In particular, how it will assist our ability to respond to climate change? The minister. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, unlike those opposite who are scoffing at Senator Polly's question, this government recognises the ability, the ability of broadband and a national broadband network to improve Australia's position in climate change. High-speed broadband has the potential to drive a range of significant environmental benefits by enabling, for example, more flexible work practices that reduce travel and commuting smarter and more efficient use of infrastructure resources. A 2007 Telstra study found broadband could reduce Australia's annual emissions of greenhouse gas by 5 per cent and save $6.6 billion a year in energy and travel costs for both businesses and households. Video conferencing and teleworking will remove the need for travel for in-person meetings and travel with order, flow order. on environmental Your time has benefits. Expired. Senator Evans. Can I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper? Senator Carr. Uh, Mr. Acting, uh, Mr Deputy President, uh, Senator Heffern asked me a question on the 26th of November 2009. I wish to table further information in response to that question. Uh, I have a or incorporate. One. I think incorporate. I'll incorporate, if that's wishes. And in regard to a question I was asked today by Senator Troth, uh, insofar as enrolments are concerned, the actual physical exclusion of a student from a school, I have yet to get information on that. But as to regard to the NAP plan, uh, participation rate uh, questions that go to whether a student's actually enrolled in a school and then excluded from any testing, then that plan participation rates are reported for each school on the website so that it is clear how many students participated in the testing and any attempt to exclude students from the testing will be apparent from this data. This information has been provided to me by the Education Department. Students are exempted from that plan test if they are severely severe intellectual or functional disabilities or if they have uh, from a non-English speaking background and have been learning English in Australia for less than one year. Exempt students are not included in the calculation of the school average. All Australian governments have committed to promoting increased participation of such students in the national assessment process and the national protocols for the administration of that plan test outline the agreed policies and practices for providing students with special support, adjustments and accommodation. I trust that assists the Senator. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. I've just been um, provided with uh, an answer uh, to uh, the question Senator Troth asked me last year uh, in relation to, uh, in my capacity as Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts uh, concerning the Green Loans Program and I think also a uh, Green Start Program, I'd seek to table uh, those, uh, that addition in to my incorporate. answer. Incorporate. Sorry, I seek to leave to incorporate. Is leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. I move to, that the Senate take note of answers given by Senator Evans in response to questions from Senator Abetz and myself today. Mr Deputy President, over a period of time that it stretches not just days, weeks, but indeed months or some would even say years, but particularly over the period of the second half of last year, 
the government's emissions trading scheme has been exposed, exposed to the Australian people and exposed indeed by the Australian people, exposed as being too costly and too complex for what Australia needs to do to take responsible action when it comes to climate change and how we address environmental issues. It has been exposed with numerous flaws. It has been exposed writ large, of course, by the time this chamber took a vote last year to secondary, on the second occasion to defeat the government's emissions trading scheme. By that stage, everyone across Australia was under the increasing understanding that the government's ETS was costly and complex, would cost jobs, would cost the Australian economy and would do all of those things for little or no environmental benefit. These are the reasons, of course, that Australia has been tuning ever so strongly against the government's ETS, that I have seen it in my electorate office, as I know all of my coalition colleagues and I'm sure all senators have seen it, the strength of opinion, the strength of opposition to this ETS and to the impact it will have on Australia. And as if there wasn't enough doubt already, as if there wasn't enough scepticism in the Australian community, along came the Copenhagen summit. Mr Deputy President. Along came Copenhagen and the scepticism and the doubt that existed about the merits of the government's ETS at that stage were exposed once and for all across the Australian community. They were seen to be, of course, it was seen to be the flawed scheme that so many had been saying that it was. It became quite apparent that Australia was unreasonably getting ahead of the rest of the world and that Australia was going to end up and Australian families and small businesses were going to end up paying a very, very high price thanks to this government's desire to introduce a very costly, a very complex scheme ahead of any form of sensible global action. Copenhagen, of course, Mr Deputy President, saw the Prime Minister head off there. He headed off to Copenhagen like some medieval king, some medieval king who took his entire court with him to Copenhagen. We saw Senator Evans today give some numbers about the number of people the government had in Copenhagen. Well, reports suggest up to 114 registrations were made for Australian delegates at Copenhagen. Now, the minister came up with some figures a little less than that. Perhaps some people didn't end up going. Whatever the case may be, we had dozens upon dozens upon dozens upon dozens of Australian government, state government, local government, you name it, hanger honours going to Copenhagen for, of course, the talk fest that it ended up being. And what did it produce? It produced a flimsy three-page non-binding accord. Three-page non-binding accord. By my reckoning, there were more than 30, probably 35 people there from the Australian delegation for every page of that accord. 35 people it took to write one page out of each page of that accord, and that's all Australia got for it. As time has gone on, we've seen that even the claims the government has made on the cost of its ETS are flawed. They claimed that electricity prices would go up by 12 per cent, yet the New South Wales Independent Pricing and Regulatory Tribunal has recommended increases of between 21 and 25 per cent, more than double, double or more than double what the government says the price rises of its ETS would be on electricity. Then we see in Victoria reports that a Victorian energy company has asked the Australian energy regulator to permit it to increase costs that could see Victorian bills rise by 400 per cent in four years. Australian families, Australian small businesses cannot afford the ongoing cost of the price rises that Labor's ETS will impose on them. Instead, Mr Deputy President, the coalition has today released a clear alternative, an alternative that will allow Australia to achieve a 5 per cent emissions reduction target, but to do so on a no regrets basis, to do so on a win-win basis, Senator Ludwig, a win-win basis where we can achieve real environmental outcomes, improve the efficiency of our soils, improve the efficiency of our farms, improve the efficiency of our electricity generators, get some real benefit for Australia for the long term focus on the 5 per cent reduction target rather than taxing 100 per cent of emissions that the government proposes to do and, in the process, pushing costs up for every Australian family and every Australian small business. Senator Marshall. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy President. 
Um, well, I, I guess it's a, it's a cruel world over there in the Liberal Party to, um, to get Senator Birmingham to have to make that sort of a speech when only a couple of months ago he was an enthusiastic supporter of the government's emissions trading scheme. In fact, he'd been a supporter of emissions trading all throughout his political career in this place. In fact, I'm, I'm sure he was one of the, the, the proud supporters of the position that the previous government, uh, John Howard's government, actually took to the election. Uh, let, let no one forget that Liberal Party policy that they went to the last election was for an emissions trading scheme. And there it was, right through, uh, a, a, a policy supported by those opposite right up until a number of months ago. A policy, a position, legislation that was negotiated to agreement with the Liberal Party, ready to be voted on after negotiated with the Liberal Party, and Senator Birmingham was one of those senators that was enthusiastically going to support that legislation uh, through the parliament. But nonetheless, uh, his preferred leader got rolled by a single vote, even though I think there was um, uh, some uh, some votes missing or some uh, incorrect votes filled out. I, I think some people in the Liberal Party couldn't even find their way to actually vote either of the two boxes uh, for either of the two candidates. It's a pretty hard task for some of them. But there we go. By one vote, the leadership changed, and Senator Birmingham finds himself on the front branch of the Liberal Party and has to do these cruel things. And I guess that's a reflection of the cruelness of the leadership in this place, where they would make Senator Birmingham come in and make a speech like that, which he doesn't believe in, which about half of the Liberal Party don't believe in. And, and, what, and what was really surprising is that I thought, I thought uh, getting up as the first speaker in this debate after the questions, their lead questions in question time today, that they'd be getting up promoting their scheme. Well, as uh, four and a half minutes went by, I was wondering whether they're actually ever going to get to their policy at all. And of course, with 30 seconds to spare, yes, Senator Birmingham brought himself to actually acknowledge that today they announced a policy. But was there any detail of that policy? Did he try to sell it? No, because he knows it's a hollow policy, it's an absolute con job. It puts no cap on pollution. What it says is that you can continue to pollute as much as you like, and what we'll do is we'll get the taxpayer to pay uh, by implementing regulation and, 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 uh, and ways that way. No market-based solution, but simply the taxpayer will pay for the cost of pollution, of which we will put no tax. Now, I know Senator Birmingham's a little bit embarrassed about this whole thing, and I'm not surprised he's now leaving the chamber um, because I think we'll be here at some point in time where the wiser heads in the Liberal Party actually go back to the policy which they knew was the correct policy in the first place. They did know at one point in time that the cost of failing to act was to be far greater than the cost of acting. They also knew that the best way to control uh, emissions is by putting a tax on pollution making the polluters pay and then using that money to drive technological change and to subsidise uh, the community for the extra costs that would be applied through making those substantial steps. Um, that's what it was going to be, tax, tax the polluters and subsidise the community. They've thrown that out. They knew at one point in time that that was the best way to achieve reductions uh, in emissions. They knew that. And of course, one of the other really disturbing and I think sad things um, was uh, with the uh, with our legislation going down late last year was the behaviour of the Australian Greens. The Australian Greens, who talk, who say that they want to do something about climate change, stood shoulder to shoulder with the sceptics should stood shoulder to shoulder with the deniers on that side of the chamber, and they voted to do nothing about saving the environment. They voted to do nothing about uh, reducing emissions in this country. They stood shoulder to shoulder in support of the deniers uh, and the sceptics, and they ought to be condemned too. And the Australian people ought not to be su sucked in or fooled by the Australian Greens. When they talk about they want to do something about the environment, they stand for 
doing something with the environment. Let no one forget that in this place they had an opportunity to support this government in doing something about climate change, but they voted to do nothing. They stood shoulder to shoulder with the deniers and the sceptics and voted to do nothing about climate change and our environment. And the Australian people ought not forget that, and they will stand equally as condemned Order. with the Liberal Party. Order. Senator Joyce. Thank you very much, Mr. Acting, uh, Mr. Not Acting, Mr. Deputy President. Um, well, it is great to be back here and to see that the Labor Party feels that the most important thing that is before our nation right now, more important than the Haitian earthquake. Uh, more important than the fact that we have got some tremors once more on financial markets and uh, the, uh, that uh, shares are starting to question whether China is closing, closing down its credit. More important than any of that is Labor's ETS. That is the most important thing for the Labor Party. So let us make sure that we understand the, the Labor Party's Maslow hierarchy of needs, of what is most important in their life. Number one. Number one, it is the Labor Party's uh, ETS. That is the most important thing. Now, they were such a marvellous. They did such a great job at Copenhagen. Copenhagen was such a roaring success. It was a roaring success. Um, every night I turned on, I could see the snow falling, I could see the canals freezing over, and I felt like ringing you up and saying, "Ease up, guys! You're going too hard. <laughs> Pull back a bit on the range. You're just you're too good at it. You're too good at it." But yeah, it was a roaring success. And what, what, did they, what did we achieve out of all this? Imagine where Australia would be right now if, they, if that ridiculous policy had actually got through. We would be sitting out there as the most peculiar political object in the world and an economic, an economic basket case brought into place by the Labor Party. Now let's go through some of the Labor Party hyperbole. First of all, they laud the process, oh well this is, you know, this is a market-based scheme. They're dead right, it is a market-based scheme. It is designed to put up the price of goods so you cannot afford them. That's what it is designed to do. And that's what it would do to the pensioners of Australia. And that's what it would do to the working families of Australia. And that's what it would do to the farmers of Australia. And you moralise about putting up their prices, but then you say, no, tarry a while, tarry a while, because what we will do is we will give you some of your own money back. And this is supposed to be logical. So they take the money off you, and then they give it back, and then they say, "Well, that is um, that's not even market-based. That is just that is confusion, except to the point where you make people's lives miserable, where you make the price of air conditioning out of the reach of the pensioner, where you make the price of uh, transport on or the, the transport price on food out of the reach of the people who need to." Uh, you know, who probably don't earn the wages that we do. When you start putting these imposts on their lives because of your pride, because of your pride and your overwhelming desire that, it's, that you must be the omnipotent force, that it's the Prime Minister and Minister Wong, they're the omnipotent force. They know, they know better than all of us. They know better than all the people who rang up this building. They know better than everybody. If only people knew how smart they were, they'd realise how blessed we are to have them. I mean, this is the sort of Labor Party we've got. And I'm going to quote to you um, your you know, famous Prime Minister, who always said, um, if you do not understand the tax, don't vote for it. Uh, well, I say back to the Australian people quite clearly that if you don't understand that, don't vote for it. Unfortunately, that would mean half the Labor Party can't vote for it either, because no one understands it. It is worse than Kafka's palace. It is Noodle Nation. It is everything bound up into an environmental economic uh, train wreck. That is what we're about to get. And then uh, Paul Keating said, if you did understand it, you'd never vote for it. And that, of course, is chapter two. But I want to add another addendum to, uh, to, the, to the wisdom of Paul Keating, and this is it. I'm glad you brought it back, because I want to do you slowly. I want to do you slowly. I want you sitting over there every day talking about the ETS. I want it going on broadcast how what you want to deliver to the Australian working family, to the Australian public, is a massive new tax because that's all it is. That is your benevolence to them. And you, I, I can see you all sort of barging out of the chamber. You don't want to be here. You want to be a million miles away from this. And the polling saying the same. The polling is a wake up to it because all of a sudden they've realised that this massive new tax is money in your pocket and a cost to them, a cost to working families, a cost to pensioners, a cost to everybody who needs it. Um, now, the trouble is that in the long term, people cannot afford it. 
Now, you want to talk about the coalition's policy. It's quite clear. I will give it to you quite succinctly. $3.2 billion, full stop. And for what, the, the greatest moral issue of our time, I think we can afford $3.2 billion. But ours is succinct, ours is understandable, yours is just a complete and utter cluster. And that is what we are going to do to you over the next few weeks. I hope you keep it here for as long as possible, because I'm really going to enjoy these next couple of weeks. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, Mr uh, Deputy President. Well, it is good to be back, of course, back into the zone where you can stand up and say what you want to, uh, what you want to advance. And what we've learned from the contribution so far today is that some people, basically, on that side of the chamber, they forget nothing, they learn nothing, they change nothing, and they, came, they come to this debate as they came to it last year, with ignorance, with prejudice, and their solution is one of fear-mongering and cost imposition. Now, one also has to say, by way of introduction, Mr Deputy President, that there is a degree, a significant degree, of inconsistency in the approach of the opposition. Just three years ago, a little less than three years ago, under the then leadership of Mr Howard, the opposition, the Liberal Party and the National Party Coalition, committed to an, an emissions trading scheme. And they maintained that commitment under successive leaders, Mr Howard, Dr Nelson, Mr Turnbull. And then, all of a sudden, because things were going so bad, Things were going so bad, and they had to change their leadership and their approach. They changed their, their policy from that which they had had for the best part of three or four years, that which they had had and sold and gone about communicating to the Australian people, to the position recently put by Senator, Senator Joyce. A nothing position. A position that goes nowhere, a position that advocates no change, the position that has no costings, and a position that doesn't require any significant change. Now, Mr. Mr. Deputy President, climate change, global warming, the need for action was a priority last year, was an absolute priority last year, is a priority this year, and will be a priority for this government for the foreseeable future. We know that climate change, that global warming, is having all sorts is having and continues to have all sorts of harmful effects in this continent, across this continent, and around the world. And we say there needs to be change. We, see, we say there needs to be action, and there needs to be an agreed position worked out at an international level to, to introduce and bring that change that will have benefit for everyone in this country the working families, farmers, small business, large companies, ordinary consumers. We need change that is going to assist them and bring benefit short term and long term into their life. And Mr. And Mr Deputy President, that was what we went to Copenhagen for, and in a large degree that was what was achieved in, in, uh, in that conference there. Now, now we know as I outlined today's press, that a number of important steps were achieved and taken at Copenhagen for the first time. And I'll tell you what those steps were, because they're not a bad foundation, Mr Deputy President. They're not a bad foundation for going forward across the world on an agreed basis to bring a solution to this issue of, uh, of climate change and an emissions trading scheme around the world. So the first time, what happened? Leaders agreed to hold any increase in global temperatures to at or below 2 degrees centigrade. For the first time, leaders of all nations, developed and developing nations, agreed to take action to deliver on that central core objective. For the first time, leaders agreed to a framework for national and international monitoring of what developed and developing countries will do, will do on this issue going forward into the future. And for the first time, again, leaders agreed on the need for considerable, for considerable financial support for emissions reduction and adaptation in developing countries. Not a bad set of achievements achieved by hard negotiation and, and clear-sighted vision 
some weeks ago in Copenhagen. Not a bad set of achievements and not a bad set of foundations on which you can build an ETS in this country going forward. We know where we're going and we know what the costs are going to be. So, as I say, overall a pretty, net, a pretty neat set of achievements. So what's the government's position? The government's, government's position is quite clear. It was outlined by Senator Wong in the press today. It's been outlined repeatedly by the Prime Minister in a set of interviews given today. And let's, let's be clear. We don't say that climate change is easy. We don't climate change solution. Addressing the problem of climate change is easy. We don't say it's going Order. to be quick, but we do say that there is a Order. way forward. Senator Macdonald. Uh, Mr President, um, if, if ever you want to see a political party running scared over an issue, have a look at the Labor Party over the emissions trading scheme, the so-called carbon pollution reduction scheme. I mean, the speakers in this debate from the Labor Party don't even believe what they're saying. And we happen to know, Mr Deputy President, that many Labor senators would dearly have loved to have had the courage to vote with us uh, the last time it came before the uh, Senate. And the last thing they want to do is have to sit through another debate uh, in the Senate on the same piece of legislation that most of them don't agree with. Now, the only thing Copenhagen achieved, uh, uh, Mr Deputy President, apart from proving what we'd all been saying on this side of the chamber for months, is uh, uh, that uh, it showed that uh, Senator Wong and Mr Rudd and uh, 114 other uh, various uh, bureaucrats and hangers-on had a lovely little holiday in Copenhagen for two or three weeks visiting the Mermaid and having a jolly good time uh, uh, around the halls of some six-star uh, hotels. It achieved absolutely uh, nothing as we predicted it would in the debate in this Senate uh, in December. And what's worse for the Labor Party, uh, uh, Mr Deputy President, is that they are, their policy, which is, which is now in, in tatters, it's an absolute shambles, uh, people are dropping off it. Uh, as quickly as they can, and to add matters uh, worse for the Labor Party, today we have uh, the uh, next Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, releasing a practical, down-to-earth, direct action policy which will reduce carbon emissions by 5 per cent, and it will cost the Australian people $3.2 billion over the next four years as opposed to Mr Rudd's ETS, his big tax on everything, of $40.6 billion over the same period. Compare that, Mr Deputy President, I want to emphasise it. Our scheme to get a 5 per cent reduction, $3.2 billion in four years. The Labor Party scheme to get a 5 per cent reduction in the same period, $40.6 billion. Now, Mr. Deputy President, not only am I excited about the Emissions Reduction Fund, uh, which we'll talk about at length when we have a lot more time, but I'm very excited that the other elements of uh, our policy released by Mr, La uh, Mr. Uh, Abbott uh, today are great for those of us who live in northern Australia. A lot of sunshine up my way, uh, Mr Deputy President, and under our policy, there will be $1,000 additional on top of uh, what is existingly uh, made available, a grant by the government for solar power and solar hot uh, water. Uh, Mr Deputy President, the Solar Towns and Schools Program, an initiative of the House Howard government, is being enhanced under Mr uh, Abbott's uh, policy. The significant tidal movements we have up in the northwest of uh, uh, Australia, uh, particularly along the Kimberley coast, uh, that, will, that tidal energy that's been spoken about for years will now get a $5 million fund to fully uh, invest—a $50 million fund, I'm sorry—to fully investigate uh, the initiative of tidal uh, renewable energy and geothermal energy. There's a $5 million uh, a fund uh, to be matched by the industry sector to allow the testing of algae um, energy, and that's being, I'm pleased to say, pioneered at James Cook University uh, in Townsville. And this fund will be set up to confirm and ensure uh, that that algal energy process does reduce CO2 uh, emissions and doesn't impact on uh, food production. 
uh, Mr Deputy President, our policy released by Mr Abbott today has 31 pages of detail. The Labor Party, when they released their ETS policy before the last election, had three lines of detail. Three lines of detail as opposed to 30 pages of uh, detail on policy. And I re-emphasise, Mr Deputy President, in concluding that our policy will reduce emissions by 50 uh, by 5 per cent by 2020 at a cost of $3.2 billion over the next four years. The Labor Party's proposals, the Carbon Emissions Trading Scheme, will also reduce emissions by 5 per cent over the next uh, uh, until 2020, but at a cost of $40.6 billion Order. over the uh, next four years. Order. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it.